I want to begin by doing something that we do in an Australian context, um, which is a, is a tradition that's developed in my country. And when, whenever there's an event like this, we always begin by acknowledging the people of this land, by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. Not only Australia, West Papua as well. There we go. There we go. So I want to acknowledge the indigenous people of this land, the Native American people of this country. I want to acknowledge that they have been here and that they continue to struggle. And I want to acknowledge their elders and their ancestors, past and present. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand over to uh, Benny and to Rosa and they're going to s tell you a little bit about the story of West Papua. Just give you a feel for that context and that struggle. And then we'll have some, some questions, some conversations about that. Then I'm going to introduce a framework for uh, civil resistance in successionist conflicts. So a framework that uh, I think is re relevant to the Tibetan struggle, that's relevant uh, to some of the uh, ethnic minorities that are in uh, Burma, uh, it's relevant to people in Palestine, in Western Sahara and other, other places. But without further ado, I'd like to very warmly welcome Firstly, I would like to thank you to uh, uh, FSI to invite me here. And secondly, I honor to meet Kusta and uh, Dr. Reverend James. This is like my dream, you know, my dream very long time because these two leader is a living spirit, I call it a living spirit, of a fight for justice and freedom, equality, racism, discrimination, and freedom, and liberate the country from colonial. I question myself why I'm here. Why I led my people with a tear? Why I led my people with hard cry? Come all the way to Western world or Europe, Europe or America. This is question all the time. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be in Europe. I shouldn't be in America. I shouldn't be in any country. That the question I never sleep. Even I'm in the UK with the good food, nice bed, my stomach never full. I sleep but I never sleep. 24 hours thinking of my people. When I go back a free man, that is, uh, I left West Papua with a tear, my people with a tear. So that is the always in my heart. But today I brought the message of suffering. People of West Papua last 50 years. Nobody knows where is the West Papua. The West Papua in Africa or Caribbean. Nobody knows. <laughs> that is in West Papua. West Papua is always in my mind, my heart. So before I move, I just want to sing in one song. And one thing that before, why this crazy or what? Is put the headdress and tie and why not to put European tie or whatever. This is who I am. This is I fight for. I'm not fighting for something else, but this is who I am. This is represent 250 tribe which is in West Papua. That this is the identity. This is the guitar, in here if you have um, the guitar made in factory, but we have made handmade guitar. So this is my tie. I never put European tie. As soon as I arrive, 
and this is my people are put there. They, they have their own special tie, so this is my tie, <laughs> and this is my headdress. It's not on crown or queen or not, but this is a symbol of the bring a unity. There's a bird of paradise. I never um, seen the bird of paradise as a other part of the world. Only in West Papua. It's very special, very unique. That does bring the whole unity, diverse culture. So that is a bird of paradise. So this song that I composed when I was in prison, um, I was arrested in 2002, and uh, they charged me 25 years. I want to show you a uh, flag um, that I, I brought up. Yeah, no, anyway, this is flag, flag. This is West Papua flag. So this is the West Papua flag. I led peacefully in 2000 with the, one of the um, well-known prisoners, Philip Karma. He's now in, uh, in, in prison. So, so when I was in prison, they um, locked me up with a handcuff and full of toilet. I composed this song. I thought this is, I want to help my people, but now I'm ended up in prison. So I want to sing in this song, and then we will see some, some of the picture and uh, uh, what happened, what going on in West Papua. This song called Wayawa. Some of them, 10,000 refugees living in Papua New Guinea, 72 uh, Papuan prisoners, including Philip Karma, is well known in the prisons. So that song is a cry for help. West Papua, West Papua is an Indonesian secret colony. West Papua used to be home of Berda Paradise, home of three kangaroos, home of the 250 tribes. But today is the home of the Indonesian military. It's home of the Indonesian military, home of the Indonesian intelligence, home of the um, intelligence. So um, I will show you um, where is the West Papua. West Papua is um, north of Australia. It is 250 kilometers or 500 kilometers from north of Australia. Very close, it's north of Australia. Yeah, what the history? History is a West Papua, it's a, um, it's a Dutch New Guinea. We were a Dutch colony, rest of the Indonesia is a Dutch colony. Indonesia take over West Papua it's 1963. So we have, you can see that we have a national, this is the first time West Papua flag raised 1960 uh, in West Papua. It's a Manukwari. You can see the West Papua flag, West Papua, and uh, uh, beside with the Dutch flag. Um, Dutch recognize our national symbol, our uh, identity, <coughs> our um, uh, national symbol, song, and everything. The prepare give us independence 1962. That we have um, at the time also we have um, uh, 
parliament, national parliament. Then what happened? This is the history. What happened in how West Papua uh, illegally became part of Indonesia? You, you could see the, the history. 1961, the Dutch allowed Papua their own flag and national anthem. That is the, the first recognition. That's why it's like West Papua feel that this is an independent country. We almost call it an independent country. Then what happened in 1962? It's called a New York Agreement. Uh, 15 of August, um, in here, this land, um, the, what happened was uh, without any West Papua involved, they made decisions. Like some, uh, like some few people gathered together, decide South Africa, decide South Africa who could we end it over without any South Africa involved. That's what happened in West Papua. I don't know the other part of the country. So that's what happened. They, they made agreements, and uh, that means 90, there's a plan was uh, 1969, a referendum. The one man, one vote, but didn't happen. That without West Papua involved, Dutch, American, Australia, and the British are involved and make decisions for West Papua future. How can someone else decide someone's future? That's what happened in West Papua. 1962, uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that, that the history a little bit. Then 1969, we, the, there is a referendum. This, what happened in 1969 is a West Papua population eight, uh, at the time, um, one million, only one in 20, handpicked didn't vote, including one of the, my father is uh, one of them. So that's why this is, this is the history. So there is, 90, after 1969, there is a lot of massive protest. How can West Papua size of France, the six official, six official, and 16 helper, but that's, this referendum was just, Fake, we call fake. That's why we West Papua call referendum Indonesia and Western power call actual free choice, but we West Papua call actual no choice. That that is so after that the West Papua become part of Indonesia. That's just brief uh, history. After Indonesia occupied nineteen sixty nine, what happened? You can see that after Indonesia occupied the killing, torture, imprisonment and rain. They just breathe. You can see the situation. That is the, the Indonesian. Why Indonesia killing us? Because one thing that we are different color. Secondly, they discriminate my people because of we are different. <laughs> Under the international law, um, torture is illegal. Why world allow? Why you and allow until today? That is a hard cry. This is the situation. Uh, what happening now? This is a picture. One of the the torture and the burn. His genital with the fire. You can see the elder. It right up to my village. The young man that put the then holding the black man holding uh, the, like animal, that's a human being. This man, one of the, the with the, he was uh, leading one of the um, biggest movement, non-violence. I will show you the hit pic, uh, uh, video later, just to feel it. Um, he's a massive, he was killed by Indonesian military, just on the spot, unarmed, just on the spot. So this is the biggest, second biggest gold mine in the world, an open pit, we call open pit. What happening now is, is in West Papua. It's owned by America. Freeport, Freeport Rio Tinto. That mountain, you can see comparison now and before. What happened, uh, sorry. This mountain called, we call Dugundugu, now they call it Freeport, Freeport Memorial. Oh. Uh, so these mountains, 
you can see the before snowing class, yeah, but then then turning to that. So then what happened? The tailing is a water becoming like coffee. That people resist. It's just two last year, last two years ago, there is a massive, massive protest and uh, uh, mining, um, you know, because of low wage and a lot of discrimination, a lot of, so there's a um, few, uh, seven people were killed. Okay, this is people talk about, um, people talk about freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. West Papua, we don't have any freedom. This is in the history in the world that only West Papua, when you're holding the flag, 15 years. I myself, at 25 years, they charged me, put me in the prison. They came, tried to kill me inside the prison. I managed to escape. But Philip Karma and the other, the other, like, for Korosia Boishembu, the other, Victor Jaimo, still in jail, 72 happens there prison, but he is one of the symbols in, in, in this, this uh, movement in West Papua. Just peacefully holding the flag and raise the prayer after prayer meeting, 2004. He is uh, um, uh, also a civil servant, Indonesian civil servant. But because of injustice, what happened is in own eye, he's, he said, better I fight until we free our people and then you know, I, I want to see the justice. But how my people are suffer, then I can work with the Indonesian government. So he left and he, he's continued to, to speaking out on behalf of people of West Papua and he was arrested. And this is the, he is uh, Victor Jemo. He is uh, now currently serving three years. Why three years? Only word referendum or independent or freedom written in the banner with the marching the people, he was arrested. And one of the leaders, I will show his picture, and I saw you already, he said that leading uh, with the heat, uh, Victor Yemo peacefully, and then after three, three months uh, three month later, he was killed. It's uh, Marco Tabuni. So he's currently serving three years in, uh, in prison. Uh, this is the peaceful demonstration because the why they got in, inspiration, non-violent movement, they're watching like video, Jason and the other, uh, Rosa, they, they, they learned and educated some other Papuans inside. So they came out on the street peacefully. So this is the, in the history ever, last 40 years, peacefully marching come out, led by Marco Tabuni and Victor Jaimo. Marco Tabuni already uh, the killed, but he, this is the, I will show you the video just two, two seconds. This is in the history, just peacefully. So this everywhere, this is not only one place, but because of what happened in South Africa, what happened in the civil rights movement in America, peacefully way, they trying to show the world because there is no media. So it's a massive movement, but media, we're talking about today, earlier we're talking about media. But West Papua is because of, I should like the rest of the world, so it's very difficult. Thousands of thousands have come out on the street, but it's still happening, still come out on the street peacefully, but Indonesia always cropped down. You can see this is world demanding self determination or independence are banned in, in West Papua. You cannot only, now they're already trying to pass the bill to not using that kind of word. If you use word, rebel or revolutionary or whatever I call, you cannot use that kind of word. It's very, very difficult. This is the woman. You can see people talk about women. Women also is a very important role to play the, this kind of movement. You can see the woman holding the banner referendum. What happened this idea in Timika? What happened? If women can lead in front, what happened? that they, they, what they, they're trying to, different methods they're trying to use to convince the people, convince the world, this we are doing the peacefully way, but many of them arrested. 
This was, I was arrested 2002, and um, because my movement, uh, my leadership, uh, leading the people in West Papua, I was graduated in 1999, that I studied politics, and that's why I try to fight back for my people. Why I involved? Why are people talking about? There is there any interesting or any? But because I feel it, I own my weak. I witness my own eye. One thing that I, I want to tell you t tell you about why I involved this struggle. One time, 1977 in my village, I was a young boy, my age about five years, and my two aunties and my mom. We go into the garden beyond the mountain. Before we go in, my mom put the, uh, took the muddy and then my mom put the, and my two aunties in the ferries. I, I thought at the time, maybe we're going to uh, funeral because we Papuans going to funeral, we have to, the sign of mourning. And then, then we go. On the way, we, there is a six military and one of the Papuans are uh, like guide. So we, my mom suddenly saw military come in that direction and then she grabbed my hand and put it in the back. Uh, behind her, and then my auntie, she's, she's speaking the language. So it's very strange, people already here. And my mom's idea is because if they see the face, it's pretty, they will rape sad on the spot. So if put the muddy, that means this is all people going to the garden or funeral. <laughs> but suddenly, military stopped, and uh, they saw my mom, and they didn't see her face, but saw the hair. Uh, Leg is very old woman, and they show um, two two auntie uh, in the back. So they saw a okay, go wash your face. They the, the wash their face, come back. My mom knew that they will rape. She trying to, uh, to trying to push her, grab her uh, my auntie hand, and then military was slap and beat my mom. She fell down with the bleeding. I was crying at the time. I, I young boy, I couldn't do anything at the time. Just, I just cry. I want to grab my mom or my auntie, and then my two auntie just take the clothes off in front of my eye. I couldn't do anything at the time. I was a young boy, and uh, I cry for my mom or cry for my auntie at the time. I couldn't do anything. They rave in front of my eye, screaming. At the time, I didn't know why they're doing this. I didn't know at the time. After three months later, we were surrounded by Indonesian military, and uh, boom, suddenly, this is the first time we never seen airplane boom in the village. People thought at a time that maybe there's a missionary, you know, because they were really scared of military, and they come out on the street and grab the grass, and they're waving, please help us. What happened? Suddenly, dropped the bomb in onto them. My mom trying to run and grab my hands and she fell down. My leg was broken. I used to walk like that. Used to, but now I can stand in, in front of you with straight leg because why British doctor repair my leg so now I can walk like very straight before I used to. So I grew up five years in the jungle, 1977 to 1983. I did, that's one story. Why number of friends are dying because we don't have any food. Dying. Our food was destroyed. They control all the food. Our house burned down. Five years ago. One thing that my grandparent told my, my dad, okay, maybe you need to save this boy. Uh, go back to loyal to Indonesia. Make flag with the, with the clothes, because Indonesia flag is a red and white. So my, my dad find the clothes, like, um, you know, to make with the string and then like holding that and loyal to Indonesia. What happened? My, aunt, my grandparents said, maybe this boy one day, he, when he grow up, he will know what is happening. So put me under the trees. My grandparents didn't bury, just put down the trees. <coughs> I've never seen him again. But one day I will find that he's born in the jungle. But I know the place where I, to, I have to go find. So after that, we loyal to Indonesia, and then one thing that my sentiment grew up in this my lifetime until today, I never forget. My uncle kept us when that, after loyal to Indonesia, and then Indonesia came to my village and took my uncle because he's very, very strong, very strong, <coughs> and they said this is a freedom fighter, a rebel. They, they, they took him, beat him up in front of our, my eye, tied his 
neck with the roof pulling from the village after they beat him up and took him to military post and what happened is they crucified. This is what they say. It's not about Islam or Muslim or Christian or Hindu Buddha. But this is what the Indonesian military said. Oh, this is a Christian people crucify Jesus Christ like this, so we want to show you. He, they tied his hand with the flagpole, put his light there, and then this is flagpole. He has to watch sunrise from 9 o'clock in the 2 o'clock. Then his eye couldn't see it because of sunrise. He couldn't see it, he's already blind. They pull him down. We young boys, so we're watching from that distance. Uh, there's no elderly people because they're really scared. They're away. But we young boy, we can watch him while we play a game or whatever. So my, after that, they grab him down. Before that, he's, he has to dug own grave. grave. After that, the two o'clock, pull him down and pull him again near the grave. And while they're pulling, his heart is still pumped. But Indonesia didn't sort. Didn't sort in front of my eyes. They, they didn't sort my uncle. Still alive, but they, they think that his heart already not pumped anymore. He's maybe dead, but actually he's alive. They pull him, buried alive. How can human beings do that? That is my sentiment grow up. If you pet or you animal, buried alive, how you feel? It's just animal. How can human beings do that? That is my sentiment grow up. With a hard cry, why they do this? Any human being. It's not talking about the white or color or it's not. It's about you cut your blood, it's blood is white or oh, red. It's red. Everybody, whoever white or you are European or American or Asian or Papuans or Australian, we are, our blood is a human being. We are one. But how do other human beings alive? If you shot that, that's fine. That's, they can dead anyway. How can it's like torture? So that is the, what that's that's why driving me to when I grew up, I went to school. One just a little bit I want to talk about the, talking about discrimination. That discrimination, racism. What happened my time at when I was in high school, this is one thing that I never forget. One thing, when my in, in the high school I one time I went to the class. At the time of first first year, I went in the class and uh, there is uh, many Indonesian students. We five people in the class. And uh, I grabbed uh, all my book went in class and the teacher told me, Benny, there is no chair. You can grab one chair with the, that girl. So I, I embarrassed myself because I come from, from village because high school there is no any village. So I come from village. So just like um, Kusta say, language, my feeling was my language very bad and accent also very bad. And maybe dress also, maybe I smell. Just, I just curious what will happen. And I went in the class. And then I sitting, before sit, sitting there next to the, this girl, and before I sitting, I just smiled to her, make sure she welcoming me. Suddenly, she <coughs> spit in my face at the time. I just wiped my face. My feeling at the time, maybe I'm not washed enough. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm smell. That is my eye feeling at the time. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm pop once, maybe yeah, it's normal. So, what happened? As soon as I left the school, and then the next morning, maybe just the day I was, I was mad. So I bought the soap early morning. I washed three times, three times. I washed my body and smell again. I washed my body and then while I'm walking, I also smell myself. Maybe, maybe sweaty or something. I just worry, it's sweaty and maybe she feel uh, smell. When, when inside the class, same class, same table, same room, I went then, so I'm really confident that maybe yesterday I'll smell. I put my books again. Before I put my books, she suddenly stood up and then spit in my, my face. Second time, whole class just laughing at me. Just laughing. I embarrassed myself. I just cried. I cried. Then suddenly like I banged the table. I got a five finger. I said, you mean I like you? I'm, I'm like you, human being. I cannot change my color, I try my best. 
I was three times my body in the river, cold. I was my body, but I cannot change my color. I tried my best, dress like you, but I can't. I already was my mine. That's I bang the table. This has never happened in other generations. Never happened. That's the beginning of the open my eye. Why did they are treated that? We try our best to be like Indonesians, but why they treat that? That is the first sentiment. And then I went to university and I studied politics. And then that's the beginning of find out how West Papua become part of Indonesia. How? Then 2000, uh, my people, uh, 2000, my people chose me, uh, 1999 and 2000, between, my people chose me to become a tribal leader in the movement. Then I was arrested. And then while I'm in prison, uh, what happened? Three times they tried to assassinate me inside the prison. Then I, I escaped, came to United Kingdom, crossed the border to Papua New Guinea, and I came to UK. And then after in the UK, I set up the Free West Papua campaign now. Um, 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 um. One thing that um, I was in UK, I set up international parliamentarian for West Papua. We're launching in in UK Parliament. Um, is uh, for international parliamentarian for West Papua and international lawyer for West Papua. Which is this uh, parliamentarian around the world come together to talk about the self determination. I'm campaigning self determination. So this lawyer group also to look at the legal argument because Indonesia claim West Papua as a, a part of the Indonesia. What? Why? Where the Indian international law standing? So that's why this all the lawyer group are becoming um, a member of this and want to look at the international uh, legal argument in West Papua. Now uh, this is the uh, meeting several um, this is British Prime Minister and also this uh, one of the Senegal president of Senegal. Uh, uh, in a meeting, in day. this is the first time in the history uh, uh, African diaspora. Also, they find out there is a black people in, in the Pacific, so they invite me, representative people in West Papua and the rest of Melanesia. So it's first time, and he put the headdress and he gave the platform, and I just with a cry because that's the first time people like this could recognize you as a you know as a human being, a struggle for freedom and justice. So that's uh, what happened. After I <coughs> launched the international parliamentarian, this is now in this room, I, uh, the man who wanted me now, I'm standing with you now, is myself. So Indonesia put international arrest warrant to try to stop me because after we are launching international parliamentarian for West Papua, Indonesia getting worried because this is like this issue, uh, you know, going to be, um, so they put international arrest warrant in 2010, and two years I couldn't travel. I just stay in the UK. I couldn't travel at all. But last year, the lawyer, a British lawyer, and one of the Australian lawyers, well-known lawyer, she's uh, Jennifer Robinson. She is um, also give the testimony because she is eyewitness in when I was tried in West Papua. So because of the movement now gained momentum, Indonesia put international arrest warrant. So, but then uh, last November, uh, uh, my case was lifted, so I'm uh, free. I thought in Europe I'm free and I just away from the Indonesia. I but then even I'm in Europe, they're trying to hunt me down. Um, so. After after lifted international uh, arrest warrant, and then I um, trying to go around the world to campaign the self determination. This is the first uh, where I've been last uh, January, February, and March. And this is a meeting with the uh, Australian uh, parliamentarians and the U.S. Uh, Congress is American Samoa in Washington. And uh, this um, Vanuatu. Um, uh, Government that now is currently Prime Minister and Papua New Guinea. So then, and this is a tech talk. You may know the tech talk in uh, 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 Sydney. What happened after I came back three weeks ago? After I came back, what happened? Indonesia screaming like in the media and trying to stop Australia. Why you allow this rebel or separatists come to in your country and they allow him? That's a big news. And every time I move. It's always stigmatize whatever you do. It's a terror, stigmatize you, terrorists, or whatever. You know, even um, 
I setting up the office in uh, London. Uh, it was a um, few months ago also in this uh, why British allow this separatist leader to open his office and things like that. So this is the um, situation. So that is the uh, demonstration in, in, in UK. So what happening now, the situation in West Papua, why you never hear about situation in West Papua, Indonesia able to isolate West Papua from the rest of the world. This is in the history. 50 years, 50 years, this flag, you raise this flag at 25 or 15 years. That's the West Papua flag. If you um, speaking um, about freedom uh, movement, freedom of assembly, holding the um, banner, whatever, you get uh, three years. So West Papua is a, is a, I always call a militarized zone. And Indonesia able to kill 500 men and women. There is already identified by Amnesty International 100,000. But we West Papuan, from it, because why that I have a reason, because a number of family were killed, never on the list yet. So there is a, because more killing is now up to 500,000 men and women. Still happening right now. Is it, that the I story, that's uh, my own experience. Every West Papuan, they will tell their own story their own story. That is how it tastes what happening in West Papua. My sister, he, she will tell her own story, her own family what happened. Every Papuan, when you meet, they will tell you. They will tell you the history, what happened and what going on. That's why West Papua, I call Indonesia committed genocide. Genocide, this is 21st century. West Papua fighting the colonialism is the first people talking about the end of the colonialism. The West Papua is still a colony in the Sea Pacific, still be a colony, one colony to another colony, which is now Indonesia, a colonized my people. So one thing that why I said this um, genocide because the population, the Papua New Guinea, 1970 is 50-50, but West Papua, Papua New Guinea population now 7.5 million. West Papua 1960 until today, two and a half million. Then migrants in one and a half. Why is that? Why population never increased? You can you can see the comparison between Papua New Guinea and West Papua. That is the, the situation right now. Thank you very much. And this is Oh yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, that, I want to show the video that man who had lead this, his um, assassinate on the spot. Any <coughs> what was the name of the song you sang at the beginning? Sorry? What was the name of the song you sang at the beginning? Uh, Wayawa. Wayawa. Yeah. Okay, this is the man who, I saw you the picture, there was uh, assassinate and his lead this. <coughs> Yes, yes. That is the first time 10,000 West Papua came in. Yeah, that's many, many pictures in, in there, but that, that is a taste. That is Indonesia fear, 10,000 marching peacefully. This is 2011, uh, 12. Peacefully, after that, three months later, the man who are lead he was killed, unarmed, on the spot. Every West Papua assassinated in the prison or in, in, on the spot like that, assassinated. I am a first in the history, 
I escaped from prison. In the history, in the history, and from direct from prison because they tried to kill me. How? Break the ventilation and I, yes, this is always question. You, you may know the, uh, the film called American Prisoner Break. Prisoner yeah. break. Yes. You're watching that. Face. Yeah. <laughs> this is what exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so I watching that many times now. No. I just seen this film many times. So Tom Cruise and Michael Scott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's exactly what I did. Yeah. I don't want to escape, but because my life was danger. My life was danger and last minute if I stay I will be killed because 2001, they killed Tais Elwai. Tais Elwai, he's also peacefully leading massive, massive inside, and he was assassinated by Indonesia Special Force. This trained by Australia, America. So when did you leave the country? I was, uh, I left uh, 2000, um, 2000, 2000, uh, 2002. It was um, before, um, yeah, 2002, and, um, it was um, uh, around November 2002. November. Sorry, uh, just a question. So you, I, what are they accusing you of in the country now? Yeah, first, uh, I, the person, the Philip Karma, and uh, we were raised the money that flag in 2000 because at the time after we Congress, uh, the massive movement uh, Congress, and then we led. I have a committee for flag raising and uh, Philip Karma, and we raised their money that flag in the capital of Jayapura. Then because of my involvement, Indonesia intelligence tried to arrest me, and tried to arrest me, and then and I hide in the, in, in the bush. And then because of my involvement, also secondly because I'm a leader, I'm a leader of the movement, I was tribal leader. Tribal leader bring the, uh, um, all the tribe come together, to, to ask the Indonesia government that we want to politically uh, come out on the streets by peacefully demonstration. Then they, that's accused. And secondly, they said, okay, you are encouraged the rebel to attack the police stations and uh, Abepura and so on. They accused me many, many, many allegations. Yes, I'm sorry. Dear. We don't have time here, I'm sure. I'll just, if you can answer quickly, because I want just to find you, just factual thing. So, do you, in other words, I would think, do they, do they accuse you of attacking the police station? Yeah, that's first. And second, uh, I leading a uh, movement peacefully, uh, yeah. raise the money stuff like that, the money stuff like. Okay. Well, um, why I ask, so the police station issue is an offense that can stick against you if you land there, they will arrest you. Yes, back. yes. Because they won't arrest. For example, if you stand next to the British uh, Prime Minister, or whoever the people you stood against, and you you threatened, did you threaten to go back immediately after that? For as you see, for publicity, if you get the opportunity like that, because if they say you committed a crime, like they say you killed somebody or you conspired to kill somebody, if you go back, they're gonna lock you up, and we can't say anything because they say they arrested you for breaking the law. But if you say you for the flag, for the call for independence, you can take anyone. There are lawyers uh, who are very willing to work on this. They will willingly uh, threaten to take you there and, and embarrass the government like that. So how serious is the allegation or the accusation of attacking the police station? Yeah, actually, it's they couldn't find my what the what the what the what the crime. The the end they want to kill me because they just be, if I they free me, they I will lead the move massive movement. That's their worry. So that's why better they want to, they just kill me. That's that's the intention. That's why I went seven times in the court. I just facing the judge. Who's in witness? Who's my witness? Bring the witness. What is my crime? Always argue. And then this Australian lawyer, she's Jennifer Robinson, she's also now a weekly lawyer. So she's my defender. She was a student at the time. It's a white person, first time West Papua history, sitting in, in the courtroom. And then she witness. So that's why when I escape, she will give the uh, eyewitness account to International um, Secretariat, uh, Interpol Secretariat. So if 
Indonesian law you can buy, you know. Even you hold in the monastery for 15 years, there, there is no, even lawyer, your defender also threatening. So lawyer or human rights worker in West Papua, well, that's risky the life, you know. That's, that's what's happening. So if I go, I, I, I'm not crime anything, but they will put you 25 years. If decide, yes, you got 25 years, 10 years. Or then the end, they will kill you. Because we have experienced many leaders are killed. So that's why I better escape and what happened. So that's why it's now I'm here. So I am here. Okay. So uh, I just have a oh, yes. Sorry. Um, my question is uh, maybe by going out of uh, West Papa, you, are, you want to achieve, uh, maybe you want to try and um, tell the world your story, like in the manner that you're doing. And, uh, and possibly by going back to West Papua, like now, uh, your voice is going to be stiff up. Like for example, some of us who didn't know that's the situation in, in West Papua, right? But now, at the or at, at international forest, I mean like wherever you go, are you, are you maybe suggesting a solution? Or possibly you're just uh, uh, saying out your story and maybe, uh, you know, uh, people just feel sorry uh, without, you know, because I think the solution is with you guys. You need to say this is what you want. If you, if you support elections, we want elections, and by maybe by dress like this, you know, you know things like this. So, are you being articulate with what you want to be done? Are you pushing maybe the United Nations that this is what you want you to do, and uh, maybe uh, give them maybe maybe even a time frame, ultimatum, you know, or you are just, uh, uh, you know, you are becoming recipients of. Uh, uh, international sympathy, but we should, we should not translate into, you know, uh, anything uh, visible on the ground. I don't know what to be your we'll comment to that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, my mission is first educate the world to understand West Papua struggle because our voice last 50 years nobody knows. When you talk about West Papua, they don't know. That's why same time I setting up we setting up the international parliamentarian for West Papua international lawyer for it's a mobilized um, uh, movement internationally, politically or legally to identify West Papua, why in the world history or UN history, West Papua is a betrayal. So that's why this international lawyer for West Papua to look at the legal argument on West Papua. My, one day, we, we hope that new referendum in West Papua. That's why I campaign on self-determination. Same time, I go in there to tell my story because that story will symbolize also what other West Papua because they cannot come out to freely. The, because we are in the prison, so that's why same time I go and mobilize the support from the parliamentarian, the politicians, and also any places I could go tell the, uh, the story as many as possible. But our goal is a self-determination to new referendum in West Papua. That's why people, when I set up that people come out on the street. Uh, if you talk about independent inside, very difficult, but it's maybe self-determination is a general world can use to, to everybody understand the Western world as well as the inside. So then we, we use the new, different tactic to come out on the street with the, pla um, with the banner to show outside world, to send the message out. Same time, I lobby internationally to campaign to self-determination because uh, 1969 referendum uh, at the time in the UN, uh, African country are, are not support. So that's why this is still there, the, our history trying to recover those countries to put the, the request to UN to review what happened in 90s, you know, give the, us the time for uh, our, our, our chance to give us a second time to, to choose our own future. Thank you. Um, I want to first find out, uh, is there some sort of like website where people can be referred to to read more or know the facts about West Papua. <coughs> Secondly, um, uh, I might not need to, it's not a sympathy game we are playing here. I can't, I mean, I may mean, not stand up and say, I promise you when I get back to Nigeria, I'm going to be the protest to their embassy and all that, that there is so much we can do, even, even if it's not in our country and all that. So I want to find out from you, um, I don't know the laws at the UN, is it that it has to take a, a certain 
amount of time before you can go back to the table for the referendum? Or is it your deliberate strategy not to call for it because you need people to know the facts of the matter before they can go? Because I, if I heard you correctly, you say African countries didn't vote for you. No, they, 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 vote. they voted for vote, you. Yeah. But other countries, or maybe Europe, didn't vote, yes. so you didn't get the required vote to be granted. Okay, so um, I come back to the resource material where people can read. And then, is there a platform where people who want to interact with such persons can actually interact? I mean, online, we may not have to convene, but if, like, Q and A, where you ask questions, and then maybe some within 24 hours or 48 hours, you get replies to it, and then people refer you to things, and then some of these pictures are there for people to see. Uh, we share that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, we mobilize the country to country. You know, recognize West Papua uh, as a, as a one of the uh, <coughs> uh, fighting for the uh, self determination. So, at the moment, because of um, it's very difficult to, to travel, but myself with other Papuans, um, now the one of the, uh, we have a campaign here, one of the elder called the Motte, he's also lobbying the US government and myself in Europe, and the other Papuans are uh, in, in Australia, in the Pacific, trying to, to, to meet him with the government to convince that this West Papua issue is still you know, we are fighting for, for self-determination that mobilize the country. Those countries could bring back to UN to discuss on this issue and put there. Uh, because used to, West Papua used to be in the colonization committee, but then uh, the colonization uh, committee leads. But as soon as Indonesia take over 1960, they remove from there. So this is like, um, that's why we have to, to lobby to government, put back to the UN, uh, UN decolonization committee to, to look at West Papua, give the chance for, for, for choose their own future. That's the main campaign uh, we're doing. And there is a few websites, and you can see that Facebook. Um, yeah, Papua. That's uh, many resources there. Maybe you can. Uh, yeah. uh, we also have one specific um, website which is uh, focused on uh, uh, political prisoners in US Papua. And we have a very complete database about how many people get arrested and what their article they are charged for and all the detailed information about the case. And it's also connected to um, other violations and situation happening. So we try to, to bring uh, the issue into the specific uh, uh, cases uh, like political prisoners. And also there are many uh, Facebook group and um, uh, some other uh, Oh yeah, one uh, source of news, we, we call it West Papua Media, which is uh, run by some, some uh, friends who are very kind to help us. So they always give an update in English, so people who uh, they can access in English. So um, I think we, we become more, um, we use, uh, uh, it's, a, it's kind of improvement uh, using the internet and uh, digital media to, to uh, and we also have a, I can give some list uh, later. Uh, we also have some uh, website focus on a, a short video uh, about uh, what happened in the ground. This is the one of the Facebook I think you can do here. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can, can this is like this Facebook page yeah. and then yeah. you can see that military in the village people. And I don't and know you can see you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just tell me what twenty thousand people were, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. What do you think uh, uh, the uh, the ambassador of uh, Indonesia will say if I write to him a letter in return and I'm asking questions? What would he say? What is their official version? Of uh, how would you discourage me to just forget about your story? You talk not yeah, just. what's Indonesian story about West Papua? There this is your story about your country. So I'm sure Jack is asking yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Indonesian story say? about West Papua. The ambassador, what will you say? They will say, oh, the people of West Papua need a development. Really development and uh, what is that welfare. So we, we will put more money uh, to the development pro project in West Papua. 
they'll also what tell you territorial claims. The only thing they'll say is that we've handed special autonomy to the Papuans and that they're very happy and that we're working together the to the develop the country. So that's, that's, that's what, what they'll say. They'll say it's an economic problem and that so we're working with development in terms of the political situation. We've given them special autonomy. That's what they'll tell you. And uh, what would they answer to the, these the kind of facts? Yeah, like uh, you shouldn't listen to terrorists. They, they, yeah, they, they, will, they will stigmatize the movement as a terrorist group, and it's just a small group of people. They always say. But just uh, maybe I don't know. I think you look, you are on right track anyway. Whether you your escape was by design or by default, it's uh, yielding good results. Uh, to start with, I've never heard about. It. Okay, and I mean, we get uh, I get into very powerful uh, platforms. I get invited to to big functions where there will be government, government and all ambassador or anything. And I can write a letter. I'll ask the ambassador if he doesn't want to see me. I'll put it in the paper. He'll be embarrassed that he. Please yeah, do. That's you please. Know yeah. So what I'm saying, you 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 are on right track. Uh, keep it up, and uh, make. Uh, I think what you should do, if I were to advise you, you must start to threaten to go back to Papua New Guinea. You don't have to go, but that's make so plans nice. that you are coming back and you are. Yes. But uh, get people, uh, powerful people, you know, uh, like uh, write to the British Prime Minister, write to the President of South Africa, or whoever, and tell them you are on your way back to Papua New Guinea. <laughs> mm. I mean, yeah, West, West Papua. Papua. You know, those kinds of tactics will, 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 will keep on making the government uh, know what's going on. <coughs> Krista, that's a really good segue, I think, to talking about the framework. Is there a yeah. 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 Um, because you you've hit the nail on the head, as they say. Uh, so I just pull, sorry, pull up. Suppose it's a closing uh, screen because you have Oh, and one thing, well, just a little bit for that. Um, they can kill so many people, they can see, uh, kill our elder, but they never kill the spirit. So we are young people, we, we clever than what they think. So we find new strategy, we know what to Whereas do. Whereas you are looking for something, I'll give you a quote you must write there, and you can use it uh, internally. It's a South African student speaking to white uh, angry because the black parents at the, at the day of the graduation of their children were put outside in the rain and all these uh, white administrators, even the, the, the typists, were all seated in the front. It's not their children were graduating and this student leader get to speak on behalf of the student that were graduating. He said, let the Lord be praised. The day shall come when every man shall breathe the air of freedom. And when that day will come, no man, no matter how many tanks he has, shall reverse the course of events. So that is what you should have in your mind all the time. <laughs> so I want to uh, introduce a framework of uh, civil resistance and succession struggles. And we'll just do a quick review. Uh, about where we're up to uh, all together in the FSI. So if you have an injustice, whether it's an anti-colonial or anti-occupation struggle, uh, like West Papua, whether it's an anti-dictatorship struggle, whatever it is, you've got an injustice. Then you've got two choices. One choice is you can fight. The other choice is you can do nothing. Yeah? If you choose to fight, Another couple, there are other choices that open up. You can fight through diplomatic means. You can lobby um, heads of government or corporations. Whoever your, your enemy is, you can try and recruit friends. You can use institutional channels, legal channels, things like that. The other choice is you've got, you can use armed struggle. And uh, it's a choice that's also being tried in West Papua. And there's still uh, people in the jungle 
uh, fighting uh, through arms. And of course, the third choice is civil resistance, which is what we've been doing. Now, if you choose civil resistance, you need to understand power, right? You need to analyze power. Who supports your struggle? What are the pillars of the support? It's what we've been, been learning about. You need to think about how the change is going to come about. Is the change going to come about through accommodation? Can you persuade by speaking nicely to Indonesia? Or will, do you need um, more assertive action? You know, is it going to come, out, come about through coercion? Or is it going to come about like total disintegration of the system? Which is really what happened in the case of East Timor. You need to think about what tactics you're going to use. And we've talked about the four classes of tactics, protestant persuasion, non-cooperation, um, disruptive non-violent intervention, and creative non-violent intervention. So creating alternative uh, systems. And then you need to develop resilience to repression at a whole range of levels, strategically, tactically, personally, at an organizational level. So Benny and Rosa have been developing uh, decentralized network structures that coordinate together so that they're more resilient in the face of repression. All of these help you analyze the situation and help you create strategy. In the, in the case of succession struggles, however, they're much, much harder to win. What, what are some reasons? Why might a successionist or a self-determination struggle be harder to win? Whether we're talking about Tibet, or Palestine, or West Papua, what might be a reason? What do you think? Then or suppose, uh, if, if some, in that case, I think it becomes a very difficult for the states to support the secessionists because you know, in, within their country, there are also such kind of movements. So they feel that if I support them, then maybe my country, uh, ethnicity, also they will ask the same thing. So we Exactly, exactly. Why would China support the Papuans when they have a you know Tibetan issue or the Uyghurs? Um, yeah, so that's it threatens the international order. Another reason that um, succession struggles are more um, are harder is because they're more difficult goals. And I want to talk about why it's a more difficult goal now. Um, so we go back to the consent theory of power. Okay, you, you map out the occupation of West Papua, and you can see here, you know, you this is a really bad PowerPoint slide. <laughs> you probably can't see anything, but you know, you've got the you've got the Indonesian military, you've got the police, you've got the bureaucracy, uh, you've got multinational corporations like that giant. Freeport gold mine. Yeah. Yeah, they just sorry to interrupt this. My question is exactly which countries have an interest of maintaining the status quo. We'll, we'll get there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll get there, I promise you. <laughs> um, so you know you look look at all these pillars. Now the Papuans are organized the most amazing struggle. You know, you saw the video that uh, that Benny and uh, Rosa just showed ten thousand people on the street. 2010, 25,000 people on the street. They occupied the provincial parliament for two days in this disciplined, disciplined, non-violent movement or non-violent campaign. So even if the Papuans were incredibly successful and the whole of the society withdrew their support, it would not be enough, not like in Egypt or Tunisia. And the reason it wouldn't be enough is because you have external actors that are propping the situation up. So you can see in the top, the top slide, these are the external parties keeping the occupation in place. It's what those cranes symbol. So if the Parklands withdraw their support, the occupation remains because you have these external parties still keeping, keeping it in place. They're supplying labor, they're supplying economic resources, they're supplying military power. So, Let's look at these external actors. On the one side, you have Indonesia. Indonesia's sending migrants over. Uh, they're running the bureaucracy. They're running the economy. It's kind of an apartheid economy uh, situation. Then on the other side, you have international players. So this is your, your question, yeah? 
So you've got the US, big gold mine, gold and copper mine. You've got Australia, um, like the US, we're supplying military aid, we're training Indonesian troops, we're arming Indonesian troops. Then you have uh, people providing diplomatic support. Other countries would be the Netherlands. But Australia, why is Australia arming Indonesia? Um, it's a really, really good question. We have Australian companies like Rio Tinto, which have joined the US in the Freeport mine, that's right. But basically, the Australian government's argument is that if uh, West Papua splits off uh, from Indonesia, there'll be a, a big crisis and Australia will have to pick up the pieces. That's the kind of argument. Um, our response is that actually, if you want to address instability, you have to work for a just outcome on this conflict. Um, and avoiding it, denying it, burying your head in the sand is not going to work. So what do we need to do? Basically, it means that if you're going to succeed in a self-determination struggle, you need, in the case of West Papua, you need to run that, organize that struggle in three places simultaneously. You need to organize the struggle inside West Papua. And that means addressing the way ordinary Papuans support the struggle, whether we're talking about Papuan mine workers, whether we're talking about people in the civil service, whether we're talking about politicians. They need to be organized so that they withdraw their support. But we also need to work with the uh, progressive forces inside Indonesia. And then we need to work with um, and address the way uh, cons key constituencies in Indonesia's allies, in the societies of Indonesia's allies support the problem. So the US, Netherlands, Australia, Europe, and the ASEAN countries. So that's all about expanding the nonviolent battlefield. We met Maria Stefan um, yesterday. So she did her PhD <coughs> comparing Kosovo, Palestine, and East Timor. She came up with this phrase, expanding the nonviolent battlefield. I've taken that phrase and broke that, broken that down a little bit into three core concepts. The first concept is you need to expand the domains of struggle. The second concept, and this comes from Johan Galton's work, is you've got to activate a communication channel. And I'll speak about each one of these in more depth soon. The third concept is you need to sever the opponent's capability chain. And this is all about challenging the Indonesian, in the case of West Papua, or in the case of Tibet, it's about challenging the occupier's legitimacy and raising political and economic costs. And that's, I'll just go back. So that's all about the communication chain and uh, is about addressing the will of the opponent to maintain the occupation. So this kind of goes back to Klaus Wittgen and uh, some kind of other, other sorts of military theories around strategy. So you've got to address the will to maintain the occupation. But you also have to address the power or the capability of the opponent to maintain the occupation. So let's look at uh, those three concepts in more detail. So in the case of, let's take Tibet. So the occupied territory would be Tibet, yeah? The occupier's territory would be, in the case of Tibet, it would be with the occupier there. It's China, right. So it's about how do you wage the struggle, not just inside Tibet, but how do you wage the struggle inside China? So how do you build the linkages between Han Chinese and other uh, ethnic groups and ordinary Tibetans? The societies of the occupiers' elite allies. But then, in that case, I mean, it's very difficult because it's very difficult. I mean, Chinese also don't agree and don't accept that to be independent. So even Chinese with a modern education go fight <coughs> democracy, but then they don't agree. It's the same for West Papua, right? Rosa, do you want to say a little bit about yeah. how you've addressed that in That's the West Papua yeah. struggle? Because it's exactly the same problem. Exactly. Uh, Indonesians aren't going to agree, oh yeah, you're right, uh, or Chinese aren't going to say, yeah, you're right, Tibet should be free, you know. Uh, same with Indonesians, they said, no way, West Papua is part of our country, this is crazy, you know. And Israel is full of uh, free Tibet fans. So Rosa, what, what have you done in the Papua yeah. struggle? Um, since uh, 
think since last year we, we were thinking about how to develop the kind of solidarity in Indonesia because uh, we are, we know that it's so difficult. Uh, many Indonesian uh, know have you know they don't have have any idea about West Papua and what they know from the media mainstream media is uh, West Papua is poor people they are rebel and blah blah blah. So what we um, try to do is try to get um, the left activists from the Indonesian and uh, because we know in 19. Um, uh, 1997, uh, 8 to 9, it's a big uh, reformation movement. And uh, many of us was a student, or we were a student in Indonesia at the time. So we know and we still have some friends. So since last year, we tried to talk to our uh, old friends and try to build that uh, kind of thing. But they always said that, yeah, but uh, actually you are our brothers and sisters in Indonesia. And said, no, you have to understand the history first. So then you can work together with us. So then we started to tell, uh, you know, tell the story in person. Um, and we as a young uh, generation who uh, born in the colonial um, occupation, we learn about our uh, history first because we don't, we didn't know about our history before. So we learn that, and then we share the story with uh, with the Indonesian uh, friends, and and then uh, since, uh, from the w one year, and we decided maybe we should make a kind of formal organization based in Jakarta in order to to gain more solidarity. So just recently in February, we set up. Uh, National solidarity for West Papua, but we call, we we take the West out from the name because West, if we use West Papua, is too political and um, many people don't want to join. So we we said uh, uh, national solidarity for West for Papua, and then we decided to not use the issue of self determination, but we try to use the issue of justice, uh, uh, freedom of expression, where. Uh, the Indonesian people, especially um, poor people and uh, all the worker class, have the same situation. So we try to use the same same stories, same try to find the connection. So since uh, February, we set up the formal organization and we got um, many support from all the workers' union and, and some uh, uh, left uh, movement organization. And they uh, once. Uh, we tell a bit about our struggle and history, and then they said, no way to stay longer in Indonesia. You should get out from Indonesia. That's the statement came from them. So that's, a, a, I think, a, um, it's it's need time, but you have to work it, work it. You know, you have to tell the story in person. That's my experience. Because I have so many Indonesian friends since I was study, so I tell them, story, my personal story, and then try to get their attention. And then we talk about the general issue. And so since uh, last uh, three months we're working, um, uh, you know, we try to, we say, spread the words about West Papua in every single campus or university in Jaffa. So now we are working on that. We have uh, tools, and we use tools, we use video, the short footage that we took uh, our citizen, uh, our friends in, uh, in the ground, they collect a video and they use one of the video camera, it's very useful. So they create like five minutes video and then we, we show that video uh, in the campus and we have a discussion and we call it, um, uh, what we call it like, uh, uh, let us get know more about West Papua, about Papua. So that's, that's a kind of uh, title of the, uh, of the um, Things that we have done so far. So I think you need time, and you you don't you can't push people or you know. Hey, you have to know my story. It's, it's so difficult. So you have to uh, touch them in person. That's my experience. I think there's a couple of other things I want to pull out from that. So, it's, so the first thing is you build these personal relationships. The second thing is you know you can't start from the issue, the Papuans have found, like, you can't start from an issue that you're passionate about, which is independence, you know, hey brother, like, that's, that's what you want, independence. You have to start with an issue that resonates with the people, you know, and maybe that's going to be about palm oil, maybe that's going to be about corruption, um, you know, maybe it's going to be about some kind of economic issue, but you've got to find an issue that actually resonates with the Indonesians. Um, and that, 
for years, this, uh, that issue has to be immediate. You know, it's got to be something that's actually, they can see in front of their eyes. It needs to be an issue that's specific, that's really concrete. You know, like the fact that, uh, you know, Papuans can't form their own political party. Or the fact that media aren't allowed in uh, to West Papua. So it's got to be specific. Uh, and it's got to be an issue that if you win it, will take you further along to your goal, even though you don't talk about your ultimate goal. And it ultimately, it's got to be an issue that's winnable. Uh, so for instance, Rosa organized uh, a success, well, was with other people, helped organize a successful campaign with uh, women market sellers, who for years were forced Since to- 2002. Yeah. Yes, <coughs> says in 2008. Yeah, so five year campaign. So for years, and even before 2003, were forced to sell their produce on the floor uh, on the ground, you know, in the middle of the streets. And the police would come and they would beat them and they'd force them out to the outskirts of the capital. And these women finally said, enough. We're not going to put up with it anymore. The police would come and force them out and they would stand up and they would strip off. And, and they bring would... their vegetables and tomatoes. And... Yeah, and then the police would back off. So they organised these women and it was around economic injustice. And they used that as a way to get the high, women from the highland and the women from the lowlands to work together. All the different women from all the different parts of the country. And the students supported them. And eventually they won their own right to have a market in the but middle of the town. it's still ongoing. It's still ongoing. It's not solved. Uh, it's still an issue. But, but it's an example success. of an issue that is immediate, specific and winnable that expands this political space in which to organise. And it's a way you can recruit support from Indonesians and other people. So let's, let's look at the second part. So this is activating the communication chain. Galton, uh, Johan Galton called this the great chain of nonviolence. And um, in South Africa, Kusta, you know, um, early on, there was a, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but my, my reading of that struggle is early on, there was a time when the, the white power holders would not even look at uh, you know, the black community as being human. And uh, so it was very difficult for the black community, for the black South Africans, to actually take their grievances to the white power holders. And there were groups like Black Sash. There were groups like the white churches. And Black Sash were white women they're actually members of the ANC, right? Yeah, people like what Janet <coughs> and and others. They so actually Black Sash were mainly mostly were wives of actually wealthy businessmen. There you they go. Were members of the ANC. They were wives of wealthy businessmen. And they were white, right? Yeah. Yeah. And very when they took up the cause, it humanized the grievances to the oppressor. Yeah. Uh, so the you know, the black South Africans found it much harder to go directly and talk about their grievances to the white power holders. But if there was an intermediary that could humanise, who was closer culturally to the oppressor, they could humanise. Uh, and the white church played the same role. The same in the civil rights struggle. Uh, the white church and white students also helped humanise the cause of civil rights uh, activists. The final thing well, the final part of this, uh, this practical and theoretical framework is severing the capability chain. So you imagine that there's, um, you take the Freeport Mine, for example, in West Papua, which is a key pillar. In itself, it's like its own little fiefdom or kind of its own little dictatorship. And Althea's going to speak about that struggle and other anti-corporate struggles tomorrow. No, no this yeah, afternoon, after, yeah. after this. So you take something like the Freeport Mine and you look at what are the chains or what are the pillars uh, <coughs> of support even something like that. So you've got the production, you've got supply, distribution, you've got investment, you've got reputation. And you look at where that, the, where that, the companies, in this case it's a company, where their capability comes from. So in the case of uh, Freeport, there are 800 companies in Australia that supply that mine. 
So you can see that, well, if we organize the unions on the waterfront to actually block supply, and they do that in tandem with Papuan uh, labor organizers inside the country, you can start to see how you can much more effectively uh, raise the economic and political cost of the opponent, how you can actually block off their supply or take away their capability to maintain the occupation. And you can look at that around arms, you could look, look at that around diplomatic support. It's essentially what uh, Benny's doing with international parliamentarians for West Papua, undermining that external support uh, for the occupation. Anyway, so that's all I've got to share. I think we've got a couple of minutes uh, for questions or comments uh, for, for any of us. Yeah, um, I, I was hoping Gustav uh, could say it. When um, the, the, they were fighting the, the apartheid regime, they had a, what I understood to be almost like a political party <coughs> uh, running for them. ANC was up and running even before they were successful, I mean, finally successful. I don't know for the case of Papuans. Um, um, I also um, want to ask, um, what language do you speak? Okay, <clears throat> well, INC is very successful because they have a political party within the apartheid movement itself. Uh, but West Papua case is very difficult. We don't have any political party. You cannot form a West Papua uh, uh, party, just called West Papua party, or Free West Papua Party or in West Papua, so illegal. illegal. So you can't do any any organization. So every organization you form, you have to register. Then everything you do identify what purpose of this organization. So that is the first. That's the first. And secondly, um, they, they they know that that threat threat for them. So they, they, any political party or West Papua very difficult. So that is the it's difficult in West Papua. The, the language we have a 250 tribes, uh, so we have different language, not di uh, dialect, but it's different, different language. But uh, we have a, a traditionally we have two lingua franca. Uh, it's a connected the highlands. It's a Kordolani or Dani, but in the coast the Piak, but they have a different language. But the word the um, my sister come from is different also. It's separate. But we use the Malay to reconnect everybody. There is a colonial language called Malay, but they are Ibahasa Indonesia or Indonesia. There's a popular version. Of so we, 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 we uh, create a kind of uh, broken Indonesian language. Okay. Well, I should say, Laz, that the island of New Guinea has 15% of the world's cultural and linguistic diversity. It's amazing, isn't it? Like 1,200 languages on that island. 15% of the world, total number of world's languages on this island. So Indonesia is destroying yeah. Our cultural, you know, a huge part of our global cultural heritage. Yeah. Is you know, imagine all the knowledge about medicine, about how to care for land, about to look after the animals and the forest. It's just unbelievable. Where else in the world can you stand on a glacier and look down on the equator? Mm -hmm. Where's Papua? Uh, are you working with something similar to the BDS movement that the Palestinians are working with? Trying to boycott disinvestment. Yeah. And the reason why I ask is that four years ago, <coughs> the oil firm kick, kicked out Rio Tinto from its portfolio. They did. It was a billion dollars that they, they did. Rid of they of did. Ethical brands. Yeah, yeah. And it was a big thing in Norway. So I was wondering if you're going after that money in that way. We haven't got a campaign as organized as the Palestinian BDS campaign. But I think it's something we want to learn from it. Yeah. 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 Because it's, I mean, Palestinian struggle has uh, been going on for a long time. Very organised. A lot of you know good strategy there. And I think there's a lot. I mean, that's why this context is so fantastic because we can have that kind of learning from each other. Um, yeah, I think just Eddie, this we are just catching up everything just last few years. We never. We don't have any freedom. Never, you've never seen any West Papua come really to t talk about West Papua issue. Because why? When they go back, they will threaten or kill. 
She is, she is sacred for her life today because of our people. I free in outside. You cannot find any West Papua, even in UK, myself and my family. In here, one of them, my elder, at the Octomoji, his lobby. It's just few people, not many other West Papua. And this is, a, I, I already said, that isolate the uh, rest of the world in West Papua. So that's why very difficult to bring the message out. But this is our chance to come here to tell the story. So please, you have uh, our voice. You know, tell wherever you go. You know, we have different struggle, but uh, ultimately we need to 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 make the the country or wherever you come from better place. But our case also, we want to leave the peace with our nature. Our mother is the nature. Uh, our mother nature. Uh, we, Forest is our supermarket. So we are fighting. It's not about political independence, but our land, our mountain, our forest, our river, because we are human beings connected with the land, with the forest, with the mountain, with the rivers. So that's why who is occupier working with the with the multinational company? They don't care about the planet, they don't care about human beings, they only care about what I get today. Fifty billion pounds or whatever. That's their care. So we need, this is like now, this struggle all around the five continents become one family. So we need to support one another, whatever Western Sahara or Palestinian or whoever people talking about self-determination, there's many different struggle, but the common goal is we want to survive this planet. So I think that's very really important. So on that note, I think it's time. Can we just wrap up in a West Papua way? By just saying wah 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 wah. Benny, do you want to explain what that means? Uh, it's a greeting, um, welcome, and or, or also goodbye. That is the the where I, we come from. Thank you. So wah 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 wah.